I am so happy to have Michael on the call with us tonight. Uh, I don't know if if any of you didn't get to hear the last time we spoke with Michael. It is on our YouTube channel. Jen, maybe you could find that link for me if it'd be possible, just to you know blast it over there and chat. I should have had that ready to go. It was phenomenal. That was, I mean, it was such a great evening of just massive conversation. Uh, it is very thoughts, thought provoking and stimulating. Michael is a wealth of knowledge and information across the board. He really is. And he, yeah, he has just a great way of succinctly speaking out some kind of difficult areas of truth and making it seem like, well, yeah, it's, of course it is. You know, I mean, just he makes it easy. And uh, I think he has a natural teaching gift that we need to kind of, we need to get a hold of or something because, you know, I, that's, it's definitely needed. Uh, when you can take something that's kind of seems like it's a big thing and, and make it all swall swallowable, you know, um, that's a gift. And let me see, let me get my, my links. I want to just paste some links over into chat in case anybody wants to get a hold, get connected. I have Michael's Amazon author page. He has a literal ton of cool books to get and devour. He has a blog called The Kings of Eden. His blog has a Facebook page. And then I also have his personal Facebook page. So right there in chat is any any way you want to get a hold of Michael, you can do it probably through one of these means. And I'll post that again a little bit later as the talk gets going because I know that other people will trail in and stuff. Um, Michael is an author. He's a nurse. Um, he ministers. He's just amazing. And I asked him to come on tonight and speak about the subject of eternal life. And as Christians, I know that we usually go, well, yeah, of course we have eternal life. You know, when we die and get to heaven, then we're going to have eternal life. And having a husband who's in a wheelchair right now, but not forever, Jesus name. Um, <laughs> uh, we have heard the, oh, you know, when you get to heaven and you have eternal life, of course, you're not going to have that wheelchair anymore. You think? Of course not. <laughs> but that is not... <laughs> That's not what you want to hear anyway. Although, you know, we know people's hearts are in the right place. They're, they're trying to be kind and stuff like that. But to hear Michael when he um, puts up a, a blog or if he puts up a, a post about eternal life and he's talking here and now and he's got scripture backing him up and I'm all, God, I got to look through these, you know, and I start just meditating on the scriptures and I think do they mean what they say because when we started um, believing for divine healing we had to change our thinking from oh yeah if it's God's will to the scriptures mean what they say and so I asked Michael to come on tonight to speak about this very subject and Michael feel free to you know move into any other subject you would like it'd be great uh, I just know that we'll we'll all be blessed and you guys really um like prepare yourselves, have some paper, get ready for some questions because Michael is wonderful when it comes to questions. And uh, we can ask, you know, allow your mind to be provoked to thought and question. This is a great time for that. Okay, so uh, I guess I should pray us in because I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Jennifer, would you pray us in, please? <laughs> Jen Thank you, Father, for, for Michael Lewis and all that you have um, and all that you have revealed to him, Lord. Thank you for showering with this, him with these awesome revelations. And thank you that he's been willing, excuse me, Michael King, forgive me, that he has that he is willing to come here and to share all of your heavenly thoughts, all your amazing truths, Lord with us tonight so we bless this evening we speak blessings and covering over each and every one of us tonight and that um we Thanks, all have the ears night before to hear i had my first like what he would have for us tonight um, in Jesus name amen yes amen. Amen. doing, doing yes. inner healing sorry about that with oh it's so good c.s lewis is works, actually was like my favorite author growing morning, up so if anything i take that as a compliment hours with this woman well you know i i see so many things i love and i i see bits and pieces of c.s lewis so maybe that was a maybe that was a god slip up so good that was I'm, cool. I'm, 
That's cool. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, it's so prophetic. Probably... Yes, it is. <laughs> that's what I do too. When I when I, uh, uh, when I if I ever get somebody's name wrong, I'm like, well, that's your name in the spirit. Yeah, that's it. I'm usually joking when I say it, but it's still funny. But uh, <laughs> in in this particular instance, I'm serious. Like I, that is actually kind of cool. It probably is prophetic. So, with all that, um, hey everybody, it's great to be with you guys. Um, if you haven't guessed so far, I like I like to pretend I have a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, so, um, hopefully, we'll have fun. I have kind of a lot that we're going to cover with this whole topic of eternal life. Uh, if you guys have any questions, type stuff in the chat too, because um, I will do my best. I'm on my phone, so it like pulls it up and disappears it. Because, um, but anyway, if if I see it, I'll do my best to answer any questions kind of while they're coming up too. Um, with all of that, though, like Diana was saying, um, eternal life. Usually, when people think about it, they're thinking about heaven when we die, and uh, this is this is probably by and large my favorite topic uh, related to things kingdom. Uh, super passionate about it, so uh, <laughs> I could probably talk for literally hours. Um, but the whole thing about eternal life is when when we look about when we look at what God God's plan for us is. Um, it's it's important to know that His plan never changed. So I guess I guess my first question to you all is. Uh, if you go back to Genesis 3, where it talks about uh, eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, what what did God say would happen if they ate the fruit? They would die. You, yeah, you'd die. So, um, and then what, so, so God had a problem with that, and that's why he said, don't eat the fruit, right? I don't want you to die. So what, is, what does John 3.16 say? And I'm going to do my best to make this interactive. So I don't know if you guys want to unmute yourselves and answer or type it in or whatever you want to do. It's all, it's all good. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever shall believe is shall live and not die. Right, right. They would not perish. We would live and not die. So God's plan has never changed from Genesis to Jesus and from Jesus forward, obviously, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So... Um, if his plan was he doesn't want us to die, then he doesn't want us to die. So the whole reason he sent Jesus is because he's pro-life, he's 100% anti-death, and Jesus died so that we would never die. The problem is that um, we in the church have been taught that uh, what Jesus came to do was to save us from our sins so that we can go to heaven when we die. Uh, but Jesus didn't actually say that like a single time in scripture. <laughs> so basically the first thing is we have to change our understanding and change our beliefs about what it is that Jesus actually did on the cross and and look at what Jesus said about himself and what he came to do and, and understand that the plan of God never changed. So what that means is I'm gonna use I'm gonna use the I word, immortality, that that God made us to be immortal, which means literally physically never dying. Um Honestly, I don't even know what the second death is because we're not supposed to die at all. So we're literally supposed to never die. So, I mean, the Bible talks about the second death and the lake of fire, and I, I'm not real clear on what that's talking about. I think it's very interpretive language in Revelation. So I, the, the jury's out as far as I'm concerned on what that means. Um, but if in, in John 6, uh, 47 to 51, Jesus was talking to a bunch of people. He said, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes, he said, believes in me. He said, believes, has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Who ever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. So Jesus said like six times in that in that statement, again, Whoever believes, have eternal life, live forever, never die, not die. Like, I mean, how many different ways can he say it? And um, still somehow in the church, we've been taught to believe that eternal life means heaven after you die. But that's literally not what Jesus was saying. And the reason I'm saying this passage specifically, all of, all of the book of John is really clear about this, and Jesus covers it a lot. But in this passage, he was very clearly, uh, exactly, John 11, that's one of the other verses we're going to cover in a minute. Um but he's very clearly speaking about physical death. He, he, if you read the rest of that chapter in John 6, he actually relates the same point a couple times. But he says, um, he says, look, your, your forefathers, the Israelites, they ate physical manna, which is bread from heaven. They ate this miracle bread from heaven. 
and and they died. He said, but you're going to eat this bread and not die. And I think sometimes because Jesus was talking sort of metaphorically and sort of not about eating his flesh and blood, um, that people say, oh, well, this is all metaphorical, therefore it's a metaphorical passage. No, he clarified elsewhere that the way we eat his flesh and drink his blood is with bread and wine and communion. So he was talking about physical bread, physical wine, physical communion, physically engage in community, eat his flesh and drink his blood, and we will live forever. So as we commune are, are in communion with Jesus, that we can consume his flesh and his blood, eat the bread that comes down from heaven that we can eat and not die. And he, he again, juxtaposed that with the Israelites who physically died. If he had been talking about a spiritual death, he wouldn't have given an example about eating this supernatural bread and then still physically dying. He would have said some other something. But this is, again, where, like Diana was saying, we read these passages, and because we've been told that it means a certain thing, we assume that that's what it means. And so we never, we don't look at it with a different lens. But in reality, Jesus was speaking extremely clearly to the people he was talking to. Uh, John, John 11, 24 to 26, uh, this is the, the passage with Lazarus. Jesus goes to raise him from the dead. He talks to Martha, and then he talks to Mary. But verses 24 to 26, it says, Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, keep in mind, Jesus didn't disagree with her. So he recognizes that there is sort of a quote-unquote last day resurrection, again, whatever that looks like. But it goes on to say, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And and so Jesus is pointing to here. He was saying, yeah, there is a last day resurrection. Okay, but you got to look, a, set your sights a little bit higher. I am the resurrection and the life. So yeah, if you die, if you believe in me and you die, then you'll live. But we're going to take it a step further and say that whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And the thing is, when the Bible talks about death, it's it's pretty clear. It's It's talking about death. It's talking about physically dead, your body doesn't work anymore, you can't breathe anymore, your brain doesn't work. Like it's, it's pretty clearly talking about death. So Jesus was very clear all throughout the Gospels when he's talking about this, um, what he believed. And, and the thing I think a lot of times we don't realize is Paul actually preached this very same Gospel. So 2 Timothy 1, 10 through 11 says, Now been revealed through the appearing of your Savior Christ Jesus, who destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. So Paul actually acknowledged, he said, look, this is a gospel of life and immortality. And, and this is the gospel that God appointed me to, to preach and teach and spread to the world is the gospel of life and immortality. Not the gospel of heaven when we die. Not the gospel of, hey, hopefully someday it'll happen. But the gospel of you will live and not die. You will live and never die. Um, and, and again, it's kind of a potentially a big mindset shift from what we believed and, and it brings up a lot of questions, and I'm going to try and uh, cover some of that. And again, if you guys have any questions, you know, type them in. But, um, but it, it takes a mindset shift to think that, whoa, what if when Jesus said we're, we should never die if we believe in him, that we actually never die? Um, I mean, Paul, Paul struggled with this himself uh, throughout, but you have to remember, too, that he died lots of times. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Um, I believe that this passage is talking, uh, well, Paul was talking about his physical persecutions, but you have to remember, he, he in 2 Corinthians 11, it talks about how he was given those 40 lashes minus one a couple times, I think five times, he was beaten with rods three times, he was stoned once. And the whole thing about all of that is when somebody gets stoned, they stone you until you're dead. Um, and in the book of Acts, it, it relates that passage too, where it looked like he was die dead, everybody gathered around him, and then he stood up. Well, presumably, everybody gathered around him, prayed, and rose him from the dead. Um, when you're beaten with rods three times, uh, they're breaking all your bones. Like, this is not just, oh, I was beaten with rods. Like, all of the all of these injuries that, that were brought to his body in this passage were potentially fatal, and I have to imagine at least some of them were fatal a couple times. Um so, so when he's saying outwardly we're wasting away, he's talking about our physical body is, is being ruined by the persecution, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Day by day, God is bringing the life of Jesus Christ is in my body. It's, it's healing my broken bones. It's fixing every injury that's in my body because it's the gospel that we will live and not die. So, so I mean, this is the gospel that Paul preached, and, and we'll see that a little bit more 
uh, as we go through some more of this stuff. But the other thing is, as you go throughout the scriptures, once you start to once you start to have an eye to see, wait a minute, that we're not supposed to die, it changes the way you read the Bible, and it changes how you read passages. Um, and you'll start to find all throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, scripture after scripture that talks about things that are relating to God's desire for us to live an abundant, eternal, immortal life. Um, has this happened to you, yeah? Oh, you mean when you read the scripture and it just starts popping out at you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, when it, like I was saying, when I first started, you know, learning about being healing, you know, that, you know, what I'm saying divine healing. I don't want to dive in way into that, but it changed everything. As I was reading the scripture, it's just like it, every time I read something, my eyes were opened more and more. And and honestly, my emotions didn't want to let go of the old pattern. I had to fight with those. There was a real war within for a while in that cognitive dissonance, you know, was really hanging on. You can't let go of that because people will think you're a freak and all that kind of stuff. And yet now here I'm walking in this stuff. I see people healed all the time, you know, not just even by the laying on a hand, just by over the phone texting them, hey, be healed. And boom, they are. And so I, I do not now limit. And when someone starts opening my eyes to something like you did with this, and I start reading the word and it just starts jumping off the page at me, I'm like, jump away. Hit me in the face. <laughs> Hit me in the face, you know? So, yeah, that's happened to me. It really, it really can be hard, and it really can be cognitively dissonant, like you said, that you have this idea that you're hearing, and because we've grown up, I mean, I'm 34, I, I grew up, uh, my dad's an Episcopal priest, so I grew up in the church, I grew up learning the, you know, heaven when you die gospel, if you will, and all things considered, it's not a bad gospel, it's just not the full gospel. I mean, there's more to it that Jesus purchased, and so we're wanting to live and walk in everything that Jesus has for us, because he paid for all of it, so we might as well not miss out on pieces that he's got for us. Um, Denny, you were saying something, I'm trying to think what it was, but you were talking about how, um, you know, as these things jumped off the page and it started to transform your thinking, that's that's some of my goal and my hope is that that this will, in some ways, challenge you guys to, to see things differently. And if you're already seeing these things, that's great, um, just to further encourage that. Because at the end of the day, like, what's the point of physical healing if you're just going to die? Like, it's honestly, I mean, if we're just real and honest for a second, it's really stupid to heal somebody if they're just going to die. It's really dumb to raise people from the dead if they're just going to die again. Like, literally, what is the point? So, you know, as you think about that, like what, you know, I've heard people say, oh, well, you can die, but you can't die sick. Well, that's still stupid because you're still dead. So it literally doesn't matter at that point. So the only way any of this makes sense, healing the only way resurrection, raising people from the dead, and don't get me wrong, I'm super passionate about raising people from the dead. Um, I have a book called Faith to Raise the Dead for that reason. It's to help teach and train people uh, to raise the dead. And that's something that in this next year, my wife and I are talking about trying to start uh, wow. classes and even like physically in-person training schools and things to help people learn how to raise the dead and engage this whole thing about immortal and abundant eternal life. But um, So I'm super passionate about that. I really, really like healing. I cry when God heals people. Like, I mean, I love it. So don't don't hear that I'm down on healing or resurrection. It's just that at the end of the day, if that's all there is, it's still kind of dumb because you're still going to die. And you like, so yeah, maybe you feel better a little bit for a little while and then you still aren't here or you just get another problem or you, well, God healed my hearing, but now I'm old and I'm, you know, can't see anymore. Like at the end of the day, there's always one more problem that needs to be fixed until you die, if that's all there is. But the, the good news is, and, and this truly is the good news, the gospel, is that you will live and not die and that you don't have to die. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to any of these problems because Jesus paid for it all. So when we understand, like I said, that... Um, God's plan never changed. It was don't eat of this because when you eat of it, you'll die and I don't want you to die. God so loved the world that he set his son, Jesus, so that whoever believed in him would not die but would live forever. It's always been about, about death. And in fact, uh, the Bible talks about how the wages of sin is death, um, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The whole reason Jesus had to come is to solve the, the sin problem so that he could solve the death problem. If Jesus didn't solve the problem with sin, he couldn't stop people collecting their checks, right? I mean, if you think about it, wages, wages is payment, right? So if you get the payment for sin is death, 
every time you sin, you get handed a paycheck with death written on it, and you die. I mean, that's ultimately, if you think about it in like physical terms, like that's essentially what happens is on payday, somebody comes with a knife and stabs you and you stop breathing. Like that's the, that's the payment for sin is death. So the gift of God, what is the payment then for righteousness? The gift of God, it's actually a gift, you don't earn it, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is the wages of righteousness. So if you want to think about the, the, the wages of sin is death, the wages of righteousness is eternal life. So if we no longer have sin because Jesus took that, then the only thing left is to live. So, um, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself on some of the notes I have here. So, um, so with all of that, we're going to, we're going to jump over to objections to living forever. Um, and after that, I'll, I'll open it up to take some questions if you guys want. Um, but regardless of what we call it, I like calling it immortality and immortal because I think it really makes it clear to people. A lot of people only hear eternal life. They think heaven when you die living in heaven with Jesus. Um, so I like to just put it out there and say, I'm talking about immortality. I'm talking about literally never dying. But you can call it whatever you want. You can call it abundant life. You can call it living. Exactly. Never dying or decaying is immortality. So you can call it living forever. You can call it eternal life. Uh, at the end of the day, regardless of what you call it, it, it means literally our physical bodies never dying. And, and when I say never dying, I don't just mean getting old and decrepit and still keeping on. I'm talking about useful, healthy, good-looking well-functioning bodies. Um, so, um, so yeah, some of the, there's some main verses that people use when, when they're talking about this subject that they say, oh, well, this can't be God. You know, everybody has to die, etc. In Genesis 6, 3, it says, the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever for they're mortal and their days will be 120 years. That sounds like God's limiting everybody to 120 years until you look at the context of what it's saying and that it was 120 years until the flood. So God wasn't saying, oh, 120 years, it's the cutoff date, can't live longer than that. Uh, that was 120 years from that time the flood came. And then, and then if we just even look at people in life, Jean Calment, she lived to be 122 years old. She died in like 1997, I think. She died, she died you know, like a couple, 20 years ago, something like that. But um, she, li she was born in the 1800s, late 1800s, died in, in the late 1900s. Uh, she's interesting. If you read up on her, she's an interesting lady. But I mean, she did all the wrong things health wise. She smoked until she was like 119. Um, so if you really think about it, if the Bible was saying, um, if the Bible was saying that you can only live to 120 years, then this lady broke the rule. So if she broke the rule, then that means other people can break the rule. In fact, uh, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So wait a second. Even if Noah was zero years old, if God's saying up 120 is the limit, he broke it by like 230 years, assuming he was born the day of the flood, which he wasn't. Um, he was 950 years old. According to Genesis 9, he was 950 years when he died. So if, if that verse alone meant, okay, you can only live to 120 years, well, then literally it doesn't make sense at all because people have broken it in recent history. People have broken it way in the past. And the guy who was alive when this was happening lived many times more than that number. So that can't possibly be what that scripture means. So Psalm 90 verse 10 says, Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of these are trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. This isn't David, this was David who wrote the psalm, but he wasn't proclaiming a life limit of 70 to 80 years. He was talking about his observations about life, and this is how people tend to, year, tend to live. We, people tend to live 70, you know, 80 years if their body's particularly strong, but we all have life problems. We already know people can live long after 80 years, so that, again, doesn't make any sense. David wasn't setting a life limit for people. The, the main one people come up with is Hebrews 9, 27, and 28. It says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And this, this is key. you got to get this because anytime you talk to somebody about immortality, eternal life, you will hear them bring up Hebrews 9, 27. Just as people are destined to die once. We'll see it's there in the Bible. It says you're supposed to die once. Therefore, we all have to die. Therefore, this is nonsense. Well, hold on a second. Because let's read the rest of the verse and the next verse in context. So as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. If you kind of boil the content of this verse down, it essentially is saying, so 
Everybody's destined to die once because of sin, so Jesus was sacrificed once to take away all of our sin so that we no longer die. Uh, he died once in our place as us for us. There's no longer a penalty to be paid for sin again, and sin again is the reason we die. So the verse isn't limiting everyone to die once. Um, I mean, what about people who have died? What about people who died more than once, right? If somebody dies, gets raised from the dead, and then dies again, then then they're dying more than once, right? And if they're dying more than once, then they've broken the rule. Uh, how about, you know, Enoch and Elijah, right? They never died. So if Enoch and Elijah never died, then they also broke the rule. So if it's destined man wants to die, then how come so many people are breaking? They're, they're rule breakers, right? So there's a, a South African pastor. His name's Kobus Van Rensburg. Some of you may or may not have heard of him. Uh, I want to say he died 14 separate times. Um from cancer. The man had cancer, and he, he is actually dead now, but he, he died, I believe, 14 times from cancer. But the Lord had given him a revelation, um, given him a revelation that he has a choice. And so, and God had also given him this revelation about, about an eternal abundant life. So um, he chose to come back every time until the last time, and I don't even know what happened then. Maybe it was something demonic happened. I don't, I don't know what actually happened as to why he didn't come back, but... Um, but I mean, he, 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 every single time he died, he got raised from the dead because he had a revelation of that the scriptures say that you don't have to die. So if we can, if we do die, that we can come back. Like Jesus said, if he, whoever dies will live. Uh, and that's not live in heaven after you die. That's will come physically back to life. So, um, so all of these people. So, I mean, Kobus Van Rensburg, this guy broke the rule 14 times, right? I mean, if, if you can only die once and then the judgment comes, well, he, he, he died 13 times more than that, uh, right? I bet it did make the enemy really ticked. Um, for those of you who can't see, that's what Diana wrote in the chat. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is, is if that's really what the scriptures are saying is that you can only live once and then die, then, then all of these scriptural things in context don't make any sense. So, so clearly, since the Bible doesn't disagree with itself, there's something else that has to be said. So, if we've, so think about Galatians 2, 20 and 21 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ live in, lives in me. So I've been crucified with Christ. When he died, I died. So the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I don't set aside the grace of God for his righteousness could be gained through the law. Christ died for nothing. So this further accentuates what Hebrews uh, 27, 9, 27, and 28 is saying, that, that Jesus died on our behalf, so we've been crucified with him. Um, and, and that's really key because, you know, once we start to look at, at all of the objections as to why we can't live forever, what the scripture says, you can't do this, then once we get that out of the way, the only thing left is what Jesus actually said, what the Bible actually says is is that you will live and not die so so i mean that's that's kind of why we're going into some of these objections first is because um i mean i don't know maybe some of you guys have already been thinking about this stuff um it's it's these are the things that every time i talk to somebody these are the first verses that people bring up um when they're like oh well well the scripture says well the scripture says a lot of things but you got to take it in context and you got to take it in context both in the immediate most of these verses, if you actually just read the verses in context of the immediate section of scripture surrounding it, like it's pretty obvious that that's not what it's saying. Um, but then if you look at the even broader context of scripture, like I said, look at Genesis 3, look at John 3.16, like just get, and just get a broad overview of the plan of God. The plan of God's never changed. So, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so if the plan of God never changed from the beginning then clearly this whole death thing is a problem, uh, which is why he came to solve it. So um, before we go any further, do you guys have any other questions, you know, that have come up that we're going to, you know, the questions about this that you guys want to, you know, either type in chat or talk? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So why do, why do we then as Christians, born again Christians, why do we see aging? You so know, that is has, it us? yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You're good. Um, I would say, yes, it's us. And some of that, and we're going to get into this, I think a little in a little bit, but it has to do, it has to do with our beliefs and, and what we have or have not apprehended of what Christ has done for us. So, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, if, if you think about the idea of aging is basically death at work in our bodies. Um, as we age, it doesn't mean we won't grow older, but the, the whole idea of aging, you know, our bones losing mineralization, um, you know, cells, you know, getting cancerous and not dividing properly and all these other things that 
it, it is a result of death at work in our lives. Now, when, when somebody gets healed, like divinely, supernaturally healed, the life of Christ in that moment is working in their body more powerfully than the death at work in their body. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, so, I mean, if you think about it, healing, if you have two, two opposing forces, life and death, that are constantly at work, then when, when death is at work in a body, they're going to get sick and eventually you'll die. If healing and abundant life is at work in your body, then, well, actually, if, if the power of life, if you will, is at work in the body, then what will manifest is healing, what you'll see is resurrection, things that were problems will either gradually or instantaneously reverse. So, so that's the power of life at work in our body. So, so the way I look at it is that we have not um, apprehended, if you will, living at the level that God's planned for us such that death cannot reign in our bodies. So, um, so yeah, it's a problem, and it's something that we are, we are pushing towards. But I think a big reason why we see death is because we have what I refer to as a, a collective global consciousness of death. I mean, as a nurse, I work in I work in a hospital, and I mean, here I hear the other nurses and staff and people say all the time, "Oh, when I get old and die, oh, when I get old, when I this, when I that," and they're, we're constantly, collectively speaking, death over ourselves. When I get old, I mean, I have I have nurses that I know that literally they're like, "Oh, I want to be like that person when I get old." Exactly, they're, 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 you're basically cursing yourself. But we create we have a belief that everybody has to die. Um, when I when I talk to people, the, one of the other things people say is, "Oh, well, who do you know that's lived to their couple hundreds? Who do you know that's never died?" Well, that really is irrelevant, and here's why. Um, yes, we know that Enoch and Elijah never died. We know that Jesus, and think about Jesus, is our perfect example. He died, he rose again, and then he has continued to live on forever after that. So, yeah, he did die, but he died, rose again like so many other men and women throughout history who have died and rose again. I mean, all of this is, again, because of what Jesus did. But the fact is, other men and women in history have died and, and, and been brought back by the power of Christ. So if they die and rose again, most of them tend to die a second time, but Jesus never did. Jesus never died. He ascended into heaven like Elijah and Enoch did. So if we really think about who our example is, our example of living out this gospel is the example of an, an immortal, a man who, who, who stepped into immortality by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I mean, when I say that, yeah, you could say, oh, well, Michael, you're saying he was just a man. No, he was also divinity in man, whatever. I mean, the Bible says a lot about that. But I mean, I think if you guys hear what I'm saying, that, that, that Jesus as a man, as God, as man, as perfect, you know, he destroyed the power of death, and then he proceeded to never die. And that's, that's our model. That's who we're aiming after. So we have to change what we believe. And I think that's really the first step, is if we want to stop aging and stop dying, is we have to change what we believe, and we have to change the things that we say. We can't say, when I get old and die. Well, why? old in my mind is, is as I get older, meaning that I've lived more years. But the connotation that tends to mean to people is as I get old, meaning I get old and decrepit. I get weak, I get sick, I get infirmed. Um, I end up in a nursing home. I can't have my taste buds work anymore. Do all of the other things that, that we experience going along with aging. But aging is part of the curse of death. And if Jesus broke every curse, then he broke the curse of death, which means we shouldn't experience those things either. So a very, very good question. Uh, do you guys have any other questions? All right. Well, we will move right along. So, looking at looking at this idea of you know why do we die and how does this work? It actually it um, it deals with basically the issue of sin versus righteousness. So, in in Romans four verses one through five, it says, "What shall we? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? In fact, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about." Now, this passage is talking about working versus you know receiving things by righteousness, but. Um, we're, we're going somewhere, so bear with me. He said he had something to boast about. If Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So, if we work for something, um, if we work for something, 
then we get the payout for what we work for. And it's not even, it's not even, oh, like, oh, I got this special gift. No, that is your due. You were owed it. Um, if you, so, so if we try to earn, then we're going to get exactly what we are work for. If we don't work, but instead trust God by faith, then we get a credit to our account without working for it. So this isn't a payment of a wage. It's like an extra bonus add-on. So it's the difference of, um, you know, you, you work for something and then you have a bill come in and you pay that money versus you just get a notice in the mail that says you didn't do anything. You didn't earn it. We're just crediting extra money to your account that you didn't work for. So now not only is this bill paid, but the next two bills will be paid because you have a credit on your account. So, so basically, when it comes to sin and righteousness, if, if you believe God by faith, it's credited to you as righteousness. And, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, but, but everywhere in Scripture, almost everywhere probably, um, but all, all of the places that I've seen where Scripture talks about righteousness, it is equated and directly related to life and eternal life. So, so when you see righteousness in Scripture from now on, think life, think eternal life. It talks about the righteous will live by faith. Well, the righteous will live. Righteousness is equated with, with life and eternal life. So if, if it's credited to us as righteousness, um, yes, yeah, so you can reverse the aging that's, that's in our bodies. Um, if, so the question is, can we, can we reverse the aging that has occurred or that we have quote-unquote accepted in our bodies? Yes. Uh, that's just as much the power of, uh, of God as anything else. If you think about it, if we can pray for people for divine healing, that's reversing the power of death in in that organ or that extremity or whatever it is that the problem is. So in the same way that we can pray for people for divine healing, we can pray for people for life and immortality. We can believe the same for ourselves and we can walk in, in divine health that whoever lives and believes in me will never die. But die, like if you think about that, we'll never experience any form of death. You're not going to experience sickness. You're not going to experience any kind of infirmity. If you fall downstairs and break your back, well, your back will just heal up right that second. And or it just won't break at all because you are now supernaturally, divinely durable by the power of the life of Christ in you. So, um, so yeah, definitely all of this is possible. Because if it wasn't possible to reverse aging and sickness and death, then, then really we don't have divine healing, we don't have resurrection of the dead, we don't have any of those things, and Jesus probably didn't get raised from the dead either. So, um, so Romans, Romans 6, 22 to 23 says, now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the benefits you reap lead to holiness, and the result is eternal life. So now that you've been set free from sin and, and are under God, the, the, the benefits we reap, the result of that is eternal life. And then it goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this comes back to that issue of wages, that the payment for sin is death, but the free gift that, that we receive freely, it's not earned, it's a credit. So it's that bonus freebie that you get that you didn't work for is eternal life. So, so at the end of the day, again, uh, we can, I, and I think as far as why aren't we living this, why aren't we walking this, I think part of it is that we're busy trying to earn eternal life. We're busy trying to earn the things that Jesus gives us freely. And a lot of this just comes from our religious thinking. And my, me too. We've all been taught this, that, you know, as much as we believe, yeah, it's by faith. And then we have to do all of these things to be holy and do all of these things to do what God requires. And, you know, um, you know, you hear verses uh, where people throw out, oh, you know, obedience, this is what God requires. And yes, obedience is important, but... Um, that's obedience being led by the Spirit, not obedience because you're forced to do something and you got to make sure you get it all right. Uh, so it's a very different heart posture, I would say, is, is, is really where we're coming from, is that we stop in our hearts trying to earn or attain the things that God is giving us freely, um, which I think in some ways changes even the way we pray. When we intercede for things, we're releasing what God is releasing as opposed to trying to drag down from the heavenly realms this thing that God is already pouring out on us. So, so where the Bible, uh, Danny, you make a good point there, where the Bible talks about rest and entering rest is that we need to enter a place of rest in our hearts where as we, as we gather, gain this revelation and, and step more and more into it, that we just understand, we just understand that it's true and it's a belief that we just sit in as opposed to something we're trying to work towards. So then Romans, Romans 8, 1 to 2, and the whole book of Romans is ripe. If you guys read the book of Romans with the idea of death and life, sin and the law causing death, 
and uh, righteousness leading towards life, which equals immortality. Um, it will totally change the way you read that book because there's th th this book is so chock full with this message of, of immortal eternal life uh, in Jesus. Um, and it goes into a lot of detail. I mean, there's so many verses that are in, in Romans that are good. I couldn't possibly, I mean, I had to pick some, but it, it, the whole thing is just amazing. So Romans 8, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. So if we're free from the law of sin and death, why do we still die? And like I said, I think a lot because we're still working for it. We're basically placing ourselves back under that law instead of receiving a credit of righteousness. And remember, again, righteousness equals life. Romans 5, 17. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So, so those who receive his grace and his righteousness, we reign in life through Jesus. Um, and that's again, so, so through Adam, death reigned. So how much more will those who live in Christ Jesus receive and reign in life? Well, you can't reign if you're dead, so you have to keep living to reign in life. Uh, so then, then the issue is, you know, okay, so if we're not supposed to die, righteousness equals life, we're supposed to reign in life, all of these wonderful things. So how do we step into that? At what point in time do we stop having our you know, decrepit, potentially getting hurt, ill, aging, physical bodies. And when do we get our, what the Bible uh, refers, the Bible talks about it, um, or, or maybe the best way to put this, let me back this up. The, the way people typically refer to it is a glorified body. Um, my guess is everybody on here has probably heard of the term glorified body. You know, when we receive our glorified body, you know, when Jesus comes, etc. That's talking about um, the a body that is similar to what Jesus demonstrated in in the Gospels when uh, he, you know, still had nail holes in his hands, but he wasn't bleeding out of them. They weren't hurting him in any way. You could still see the wound, but, I mean, his body was fine, basically. It wasn't hindered in any way. There was no pain. He could appear in a room. Uh, now, everybody says he walked through the wall. It just says he appeared in the room. So whether he just basically translocated or teleported into the room or walked through the wall is irrelevant. The point is, his body was doing things that defy laws of natural physics. So when we're talking about, um, and then Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, redescend as float or fly, right? He lifted up off the ground so you could pass your arm under him, and he didn't come back down to the ground. So he, you know, Jesus floated or flied or levitated or ascended into heaven. This is just some examples of the type of thing we're talking about. When the Bible talks about something in, I think Timothy maybe, I don't remember where, it talks about in which you shine like stars as you hold out the word of life. Well, where else did we see people shining like stars? We saw Moses with his face shining with the glory of God in the Old Testament, and then again on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, they shone with the glory of God. So, if the Bible, if Paul was talking about in current tense in which you shine like stars, not will someday in heaven shine like stars as you hold out the word of life, then, then that's part of, part of the glorified body, if you will, includes light, the light of heaven and the light of Christ emanating from within us. And, and there are people throughout, throughout history that have experienced this, this miracle phenomenon, but I believe that's just the first fruits of, uh, of what God's doing uh, in regards to what what does it look like to have this immortal body? So so let's see in, in Romans four eighteen to twenty four, it's talking about uh, Abraham, and and going back to the promise that God gave Abraham. So Romans four eighteen to twenty four it says against all hope Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of, promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So even in the Old Testament, we're seeing this issue of righteousness working out. Abraham's body, he was 100 years old. 
So his it says his body was nearly dead. He was a hundred years old, but he received. He believed God in faith, and this was credited to him as righteousness. Now, this credit was a real thing. He, it, it was a real thing. He was credited as righteousness. So, and again, if righteousness equals life, in spite of the fact that his body was failing, he he received this credit of life. His body, his sexual organs, like all of these things, started functioning properly, and then obviously Sarah's did too. So that he was able to conceive not just one, but two children while he was extremely old. And then he lived on for years after that uh, to help raise them. Exactly. He had another wife after Sarah. So, I mean, he had multiple, multiple children with multiple people. He lived many years older than some of us do because he believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And again, he was credited basically the power of life within his body is a way you could read that. Um, so... So if you think about it, just in the Old Testament, Abraham, without, without living under the new covenant with Jesus, he attained, he received, he stepped into a measure of this immortal abundant life that Jesus has for us simply by believing what God said. And because he believed by faith, didn't do anything to work for it. Okay, maybe he made some hiccups along the way with uh, Haggai or whatever her name was. Um, but... Uh, Sarah's maidservant, but um, as a whole, he believed God, and I think he was just trying to help God out a little, say, well, God, you know, Sarah's not doing so great, so maybe maybe this is what he means. Well, uh, Hagar, thank you. Um, started with an H. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think he was trying to help God out, basically, but uh, at the end of the day, he, he stayed firm in his faith that God said this, and therefore God's going to do it, and and true to it, he lived far longer than basically anybody else in his day. So Romans 6, 3 to 10 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. I'll read that again. We, our old self was crucified. We died with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who's died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But life he lives, he lives to God. It didn't say he lived once once and for all for himself. It says he died to sin once for all, meaning for all people. So basically this passage is saying that we've died to sin and we get raised into the new life with Jesus. If the body of sin has been done away with, like it says in verse 6, then there's nothing to reach wages for that sin. So we were talking about the wages of sin is death. If the body of sin has been done away with, there are there's no ability for us to reap wages for sin because as verse 7 says, anyone who's died has been set free from sin. So verse 9, since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. So if we believe that as verse 8 says that we died with him and we were raised with him, then death no longer has mastery over us either. So if we've already died with Christ, we've been raised with him, we no longer need to look for some far off reality of something yet to come uh, for us to sort of attain to, to, to this everlasting, immortal, eternal life. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So, so these verses really honestly suggest, and this is, this may be a little bit hard for people too, but it says that we're already living in the new. So what if I told you that the scriptures say that you already are in your glorified body right now? Yes, I do get that that's hard to believe. Uh, because again, we are all living in, in this physical body that doesn't seem very much like that, that we still get sick, we still have issues, whatever. But what the scriptures actually say is that the body of sin was done away with. The thing that, that, that causes sin to be applied to our lives is gone. It was circumcised off. When somebody gets circumcised, they, like, it's not attached anymore. It's not like dangling by a thread. It's, not, it's, it's gone. So uh, when, <laughs> when the body of sin is done away with, there's nothing left for the sin to cause death to. Um, so this isn't a far off reality. This is something that the old creation, the old man, the body of sin has been done away with. So now we are currently in newness of life with Jesus. 
So the idea that we have to die and leave our bodies behind, it's actually a Gnostic heresy. So to give sort of an insufficient and, and brief summary of the Gnostics, the Gnostics believed that, that physical was evil and spiritual was good. And I'm kind of really glossing over their beliefs, but, um, but that's sort of the basic summary. <coughs> Excuse me. Is that the two heresies the Gnostics brought to the church, and Paul was working to stamp these out in his day, and he did about 50%. The two heresies they brought to the church were, one, that Jesus didn't come physically. Um, and that's because if he came physically, that he would then be giving himself over to evil, because physical is evil, spiritual is good. So Jesus came as he was a spirit being only and didn't come physically. Well, that's why Paul says, no, Christ came in the flesh. Uh, and anyway, maybe it was John, whoever it is that said it, it, said Christ came in the flesh. Basically, if you don't believe he came in the flesh, you're preaching another gospel, and that's not this gospel. So... That was point number one that the Gnostics believed. And the other thing that goes along with that is that we have to die and leave our physical bodies behind in order to become spirit beings who are perfected. And truthfully, this is basically what the current day church believes about how we have to die and go to heaven. Now, I'm not, I'm not anti-heaven. Heaven's a wonderful place. Um, it's just that that's not what Jesus did for us. Jesus didn't die so we could die and go to heaven. He actually didn't even say a single time that we're supposed to die and go to heaven. In John 14, he said he's the door and that he was going to prepare a place for the disciples so that he'd come and bring us to be with him where he is. In John 17, you know, a couple chapters later, he's still talking to the same people in the same conversation. He prays that they would not be taken out of the world. So all throughout the book of John, we can see Jesus talking again and again and again about eternal life and about living forever. But that wasn't talking about after we die somewhere in heaven. It was talking about here and now on earth. Um, and, and again, this is... This can be a little tough because it's like, okay, so I hear you're saying this stuff, you know, the Bible says this stuff, so why aren't we living it out? Um, and that's a great question. And part of that, I have some ideas, but I think the fact is that until we start walking more and more in this revelation, that we're not going to see the fullness of the manifestation. Um, total, complete healing. How would you keep it once you get it? Um, so, so once we get totally healed, how do we keep it once we get it? I think... I think that's the whole thing is as we, as we pursue this revelation, this understanding that we are not supposed to get sick, we're not supposed to die, and that honestly, that is a radical departure. Um, it's a radical departure from what we've been taught. And, and once we depart from that and change our thinking and start to live in this new reality, um, so, so here's a question. How many of you have raised somebody from the dead? Yeah, animals. Any 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 being that was dead of some kind, raised from the dead. Okay, so that's one of you guys. I haven't either, but I've prayed for twenty plus. Okay, two. Awesome. Um, you guys rock. But do you think that you would have seen anybody or anything raised from the dead if you didn't believe in raising the dead? Right. I mean, how many? If you didn't believe in raising the dead, how many dead animals or people would you have prayed for? Probably none, right? So if you don't believe in raising the dead, you're not going to pray for anybody to see them raised from the dead. So therefore, you're not going to actually see that scripture manifesting. How about healing? If you don't believe God still heals people, you're not going to pray for people to get healed, and therefore you're not going to see people get healed. So I think the main reason we're not seeing this reality yet is because people don't believe that it's true. So they're not pursuing it. They're not walking in it as a result. Because again, we apprehend this by faith. So if you don't apply your faith, it's a nice idea you've never heard of that you don't believe in. And so your faith is that you're going to die. Well, according to your faith, let it be done to you, said Jesus, right? So if you believe that you want, you're going to die, you can have it. I mean, I don't recommend it, but you can have it if you want to die. Um, and yeah, Diana, you just po popped up the scripture in John where it says, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, if you think about how Jesus is right now, in addition to being seated at the right hand of the Father, he is an eternal immortal being who never died. Uh, or he did die, he rose again, and then proceeded to stay alive after that. Um, so if as he is now in an eternal glorified body, so are we in this world. It's not something we need to wait for for a far off day. What we have to do is basically just immerse ourselves in the true gospel. And yeah, it might sound kind of arrogant. What well, Michael's saying, it's the true gospel. Well, it is. If you really start looking through the scriptures... Um, this is the gospel that Paul preached. It's the gospel that Jesus preached. And while there's a lot of other details to that gospel, if the gospel does not include life and immortality, 
then it's ignoring large parts of things that Paul said. It's ignoring large swaths of things that Jesus said, and therefore it's not the whole true complete gospel that Jesus Christ purchased and paid for us on the cross with his blood. So, like I said, it may sound kind of arrogant, but I think honestly it's just a fact that this is what Jesus paid for. And, and we, all of us, have been blinded to this because the enemy doesn't want us to see that. The enemy doesn't want us to understand that this is the fullness that God has for you. Because if we see it, then we'll start to step out and apprehend it. And if we apprehend it, then we got a problem because the enemy wants us dead. And if he, we realize we don't die, then he's got a real problem on his hands. So, um, one of the things, and I was talking to my wife about this last night, um, there, there are two different ways people can communicate a message, and this is kind of my own, my own breakdown, if you will, of how, how somebody in the kingdom can be preaching a message. There's a prophetic message, and there's an apostolic message. And, and again, this is, again, my terminology, but an apostolic message, in my mind, is something that somebody is living out, has attained and apprehended, and they're walking in. It's something that's been established. A prophetic message is, is something that, that we're pressing towards. It's, it's when you see a truth far off. It's like John Wimber, he said, I see these things in the scriptures. I see these things about healing. He's like, and I'm not seeing this happen. So I haven't, I'm not walking in this yet, but there's a truth that I see in scripture. And so I'm calling things that be not as though they were. I'm pressing towards this. And that's, that's really collectively or where we're at, I think, in this time in history with the message of, of abundant, immortal, eternal life is, is it's a prophetic message that we are reaching into the promises of God and we are apprehending that. So the good news is you guys are on the, the front end of this. Um, the, the bad news is that we have to still apprehend a lot of it. Um, but in reality, that's good news because it just means we get to see the awesomeness happen in front of our eyes uh, when God shows himself strong on our behalf. So... Uh, second Peter one, three to four. So yeah, super exciting times. I'm, I'm super stoked. Like I think uh, as much as part of me, I have friends, like one of my best friends is 72. And so I'm not super stoked at the idea. Like part of me is like, God, we really have to apprehend this because I really don't want one of my best friends to die. Like that would make me very upset. Now, yeah, I'll try to raise it from the dead period. No questions asked, but uh, I don't like the idea. I really don't like death. So, uh, uh, I'm like, God, can we speed this up a little bit? Because, you know, people die every day, and that's not okay because it's not what you purchased. So, so yeah, I mean, there's some tension there, but but as a whole, it's exciting because God's releasing things to us here and now. Um, so so this whole idea that we, um, we're already kind of living in or stepping into or Jesus has already done whatever we need to have this body that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 and four says as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue which have been given to us uh by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust so and this verse is saying his power has given us everything relating to life and godliness well, including a glorified body everything to everything that pertains to life everything means everything so uh, through Jesus, we've received everything we need. So, and we've been given these promises so that through these, we can partake of the divine nature. Now, the divine nature, they clarify, includes escaping corruption that's in the world. So, if, if this divine nature, if God's given us everything we need to live life in abundance so that we can escape the corruption that's in this world, that these are precious promises. It kind of acknowledges that, yeah, you haven't apprehended it yet, but we're pressing on, like Paul said, we're pressing on towards the prize of the upward calling of the sin Christ Jesus. Not that I've already attained it, but I'm pressing on towards the mark. Um, Paul, like I said, preached the gospel of life and immortality, but he wasn't walking in it 100% either. So he's saying, look, not that I've already attained it, but I'm pressing on towards the goal. Uh, exactly. We haven't arrived yet, but, but we've left the station, right? I mean, we may not be at the destination, but we're on the journey. We're en route. So um, so the Bible honestly suggests that we're not even doing away with our bodies, but that there's a transformation that's taking place even now uh, as the life of Christ is working in us. So um, this whole thing about bodies and, you know, keeping our body, uh, it, it goes against everything that we've been taught in Christianity because we have to die in order to get to heaven, Right. But again, the scripture says, Jesus says, I'm the door. So, so here's a question. If you have to pick uh, between death being your door and Jesus being your door, which one would you pick? Real question. What would you guys say? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? If you have to pick death or Jesus and the two are juxtaposed with each other, then, then you're going to pick Jesus. And the thing is, the Bible is clear, like, death is juxtaposed. It's, it's in opposition to de- Jesus. It says that death is an enemy of God. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Uh, Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill. Kill means death. Steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life. Jesus said very clearly, look, you used to believe in the old way of Hebrew thinking, and this is truthfully the Hebraic mindset, is that every being that exists is works for God. So angels, demons, all of them are emissaries, messengers, and, and they work for God. So they believe Satan was an employee of God. So if somebody dies and they destroy or comes and kills and destroys... Well, that's God's hand at work because the destroyer is one of God's employees. He's on his payroll. Well, Jesus said, no, 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 no. That's not how this goes. You've believed that this is how it is. But Jesus, I mean, Jesus did this left and right. He was like, a new command I give you. He's like, it's been said. He's like reading the law to them. He's like, it's been said this. They're like, "Uh, Jesus, that's the law. He's like, well, yeah, but a new command I give you. They're like, and who are you? He's like, oh, I'm the son of God. They're like, stone him. I mean, Jesus was a radical dude. He's like, no, no, he's like, you don't understand that the way of the kingdom is very different than you've been taught. And and that's the same thing we're having to come into now is the way we've been taught is very different than how the kingdom is. So, so when, um, when Jesus says, you know, death's an enemy, he says, I come that you have life. He, he put himself in a hundred percent opposition to, to us dying. So, so again, all of these places that we're supposed to keep our bodies, but it's a challenge to see how does that work. So uh, re- again, here's some real questions for you guys. When Jesus rose again, did he get a new body or did he take his original body with him? Right, he kept the same body. The, gra- the, the, the scripture is very clear that the grave, the tomb was empty, right? So if the tomb was empty, either Jesus, you know, burned that body into ashes and, you know, I guess manifested a new one somehow, or he rose actually from the dead in his current body, which is what happened. So when Enoch went to heaven without dying, did he leave his body behind? No, he didn't. When Elijah went up in a whirlwind, did he take his body with him? Yeah, Elijah, when he went up in a whirlwind, he went up, I mean, he stepped physically into this whirlwind. Everybody thinks it was the chariot. The chariot just went by. I don't really know what it was doing. Uh, That's right. He didn't take his coat, but he went up in in the whirlwind. So all of these examples that we see, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he went with the body he took out of the grave that rose from the dead and went up. So, So the examples we see in scripture, people took their body with them. Here's a tricky one for you. How about Moses? Did Moses get a new body? No, right? Here's where it's tricky, because in Jude, right? In, in the book of Jude, verses 9 and 10, it says that uh, Michael fought over Moses' body um, with, with Satan, because Satan wanted, went to come and take Moses' body, and Michael the archangel fought with him over it, right? Why would you care about Moses' body if God's just going to make a new body, right? doesn't matter. He's going to get a new glorified body anyway. He doesn't need that old ratty thing, right? Um, that old decrepit. No, it's because... God, your body is important, and that is <laughs> drastically different than what we've been taught, because, you know, we need to just leave this old shell behind, you know, so we can get our new glorified spiritual body in heaven, right? But when Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, I believe actually the reason, <laughs> I believe one of the reasons that God went and had Michael get Moses' body is because he needed his body to appear on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. So while yes, Moses did die, I think to some extent God raised him in some fashion, however God worked that out, because Moses and Elijah both appeared as living beings on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And you actually see in scripture where it says that God picked up Moses' body, right? So, I mean, I think it's fascinating in that even the examples we see throughout scripture confirm that, yeah, the physical body is important, But it's the Gnostic heresy that is actually a heresy that has crept into the church and existed there for thousands of years. That's the thing that says our body's bad, we need to get rid of it, and and head off to heaven. So so really, the common belief of the church is actually a heresy that Paul was trying to stamp out in his day. So, um, and even on the Mount of Transfiguration, even Jesus was transfigured in his body as a human. So if Jesus could have it pre-cross... even for a short while, Moses in the Old Testament shone daily with the glory. How much more, you know, and it says it was a fading glory for Moses. How much more should we be living out of this reality? Because Jesus has already done it for us. So the, the next common question is, why does it seem like we're living it out? We still get sick. Many people die. You know, 
so and that's what I said earlier. You know, have we really stopped working for righteousness? I, I mean, in all honesty, I don't know that I have. Um, I am, I am very good at, you know, sort of pursuing things in the kingdom. But a lot of times, I think I get into striving, and so I have to kind of self monitor and make sure that I'm not doing it from a place of working hard to earn something. That I have to step into it from a place of rest, knowing that God has it for me. Um, so I mean, that's that's. Um, that's something that we, you know, have to have to watch out. Are we working to attain this? And and the more we work to attain it, you know, again, if you work to attain something, it gets paid to you as a wage you're required. But that means probably you also get the wages of your sin, which then kills you. So it's probably not a great plan. So so at the end of the day, we want to simply walk in faith, believing that Jesus did what he said he did, and then we get credited to us as righteousness, and again, righteousness equals life. So Romans 8, and so, and the reason I'm kind of harping on this whole thing about the physical body is, is because I, I really want to knock against this belief of heaven when you die, and that we just need to wait until we get that other body somewhere else, because um, everybody's waiting for the new heaven and the new earth. When God destroys this one, and the new heaven and the new earth come out, and everything's all happy and hunky-dory, but... What if, in Revelation, where it talks about how there's a new heaven and a new earth, what if that was a representative picture of the decay having been removed from the entire universe, right? Uh, or, or a little earlier, I forget which one it was, but we, we read a verse that talked about us having escaped the corruption that's in this world, our bodies having escaped corruption. Well, in Romans 8, it talks about that corruption, eight, uh, Romans 8, verses 18 to 23, it says, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Creation's waiting for us, right? Verse 20, it says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So if we compare this, creation itself is in bondage to decay, corruption to decay, same thing. It's in bondage to decay, and it's wanting to be brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Well, again, that's juxtaposing itself, that bondage to, bondage to decay versus freedom and glory of the children of God. Well, freedom and glory of the children of God is no corruption, no decay, no death, immortal, abundant life. So, all creation, that means Mars, which is, you know... SpaceX just, you know, launched whatever to go there. Like, like Mars, which is this fiery, unlivable... You know, I don't even know what kind of atmosphere. Um, the asteroid belt. When there was a war in the heavens, why is there an asteroid belt? Theoretically, there was a large, larger body of something that got blown up into a bunch of smithereens, and now there's a bunch of space rocks floating around orbiting, which is why it's a ring, right? Because it was something that used to be in one piece. This is, again, my assumption, that there was something or some things that got destroyed in the universe that caused there to be the asteroid belt. So... If we're re being released, if all creation, even in outer space, is being released from its bondage to decay and brought into the liberty of the sons and daughters of God, then it means we're having to live in a decay-free, bondage-free life in order to release it to the rest of creation. So if we go on to verse 22, it says, We know the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present. Not only so, but ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So, so the first thing is, like I said, all creation is waiting for us to step into fullness. Um, but if we remove the decay from the universe, presumably we also don't have decay in our bodies. So what do we need new bodies for? Right? I mean, they're decay-free. If they're decay-free, they can't die, which means we'll never die, which means we're mortal, problem solved. So why? So, I mean, it, Romans 8 is even suggesting, basically, that if we're removing the decay from the universe, we don't need a quote-unquote new heavens and a new earth because we've fixed the one we're in. I think realistically, prophetically, that, that what Revelation is talking about is the time when, you know, all things have reached their fullness and we re restore the earth and all of creation uh, to God's original design. Because, again, he's never changed his plans. So the second thing is that we have this, this says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit. So, Diane, I know you guys are putting Bible verses in. I kind of cheated. I went uh, 18 to 23. Uh, I stopped, stopped at 21 that first time. But anyway... Um, so, 
so we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. I, I think this speaks to uh, <laughs> I think this speaks to the process that we're going through towards living this out in fullness. Uh, Paul, you talked about this in Philippians three ten through fourteen, uh, and I quoted this a little bit earlier. Uh, Philippians three ten through fourteen. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So as we become like Him in His death, then we exp- attain to the resurrection from the dead, which is a manifestation of life. So verse 12 is key. Not that I've already attained this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So I'll just have to apologize to you guys now. I'm not I'm not walking this out fully myself either. Um but that's why I said this is a prophetic message. This is a prophetic teaching speaking to and pulling things that be not as though they were, that we're pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of us. So even if I haven't taken a hold of it yet, which I personally don't consider I have, I just echo the words of Paul, which is that we're pursuing something that God has for us. Um, and, and this whole idea of, of that there's this first roots of things to come, there's this deposit Ephesians 1.14 and 2 Corinthians 1.22 both talk about this as well. Um, so I'll just say it again. It's Ephesians 1.14 and 2 Corinthians 1.22. They, they both talk about the Holy Spirit as a deposit of things to come. So, And I believe that as we continue to believe God in his word, in faith, that we're not working for it, we're not earning the wages of righteousness, that we're going to see this come to pass. Uh, Romans 8, 10 through 11 also talks about this. So Romans 8, 10 through 11 says, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Again, there's righteousness in life. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So, so even there again, we're seeing that, that because Jesus lives in you, that the Holy Spirit is going to take your mortal body and give life to it, not swap it out for a new one. Um, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 talks a lot about the resurrection body and what people again refer to as our glorified body. I think it's important to note there that when you read that section, Paul's talking about an end times resurrection. He's not really talking about living free of decay as immortal beings who, like Jesus, never died. Um, So if you read that passage, especially the latter half, starting at verse 35, it covers a lot about what kind of bodies people get and how eventually we won't all die, but eventually have our bodies changed right at the end when Jesus comes. And if you read that passage, I think it is a little bit confusing because it's talking about immortal bodies and, you know, being clothed with immortality. Um, but I think God gave Paul a revelation of something that he didn't have the full understanding of at the time. I haven't actually looked it up. and I, I will probably at some point here looked up to see when he wrote that, that epistle versus compared to when he wrote some of the other ones like Romans. Um, because, because I think Paul glimpsed, like, you know, he says in first Corinthians 13, we see through a glass dimly. I think he glimpsed a reality of things to come, but he didn't have the full picture because the passage clearly says that we only get a transformed body when Jesus comes at the second coming. And if you happen to be alive at the time, but the truth is, if I have to pick who I'm going to believe, I've got to go with the gospel that Jesus preached over the particular set of scriptures here that Paul wrote. And, and that's, that's again, Paul preached the gospel of immortality. It's all throughout the epistles in the New Testament. So I think he just saw in part when he wrote this particular thing. And, and if you look at where he clarifies it elsewhere in scripture, he goes on to talk about, um, you know, the, he goes on to talk about the manifestations of this immortal life. Like I said, though outwardly we're perishing, inwardly we're being made new day by day. You know, in Second Timothy, the gospel of life and immortality, of which I have been appointed as a herald and a teacher and an apostle. Um, so, I mean, I mean, Paul, I think, was pretty clear that this is how we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to have this transformed and glorified body. And, yeah, I believe, you know, the dead in Christ who are in Christ will rise first. Yeah, God's going to get them. I don't know how God's going to work that out, in all honesty. I don't know if he's going to get them new bodies, if he's just going to, you know, add cool more matter to the their decaying bodies and graves. Like, I don't, God's going to have to be big enough to work out all those details. But, um but, but I think the key important thing here is that we don't have to wait for some far off day when Jesus comes, whenever that's going to be, because everybody's thought it's going to been happening for about 2,000 years now. Um, 
We don't have to wait for a far off day to live in and attain to the things that he's promised us. So, so these, these scriptures that talk about how, you know, we can, you know, be healed, these scriptures that talk about how we can live and not die, um, these are now promises for us. Um, there's actually, I forget where it was, I think it might be in Romans, but there's something that talks about obedience leads to righteousness, righteousness leads to something else, something else leads to eternal life. There's this whole process that God's taking us through as we apprehend and attain this, um, and, and as we do that, that we're going to walk it out. So, um, I think, you know, like I said, but this whole transformed body thing, it may seem like semantics to some people, but I think the whole thing is that, um, and the reason I'm kind of harping on this is that I think that we're so used to this idea that we leave our body behind and go to heaven when we die and get this new special body, um, um, that wasn't quite the verse, but that's a very good one. The whole the whole chapter of Romans, the book of Romans is amazing. Um, so so the gospel we've learned is a heaven when we die gospel, and according to our collective faith, it's it's been unto us, you know, as a human race. So what we're now seeing is that our understanding about this true gospel that Jesus came to give us is transforming. And I believe that as we shift our understanding from a heaven when we die reality to a whoever lives and believes in me will never die, that that we're going to start to see that shift in our beliefs. Um, and that I think really is the key is everything, everything that happens, God starts by bringing a revelation. You know, Azusa Street, God brought a revelation about tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God brings these revelations about things. You know, he says in Amos, I think chapter four, it says, you know, um, I do not, the Lord does nothing without selling, telling his servants, the prophets. God speaks to people when he wants to do something in the earth, release a revelation, release the truth. And the whole point of revelation is to bring transformation. It's not just to have a, a nice new idea. So, I believe that the whole point of this is that as we as we apprehend and attain this revelation that God gives life to the dead and then keeps them alive, that whoever lives and believes in me will never die, that, that we're going to continue to walk this out. So uh, I know I've been kind of talking for a while. Um, throw any questions you guys have, and it doesn't necessarily have to be related to this, but if you guys have any questions at all, I mean, I'm going to stop a little bit and give you guys room to even just share your own thoughts or talk or whatever. I always have questions. Um, one of them I was just thinking about when you were talking was uh, because, you you know, you were talking about how, um, you know, God speaks to the prophets and he brings things forward. Yeah, I, I understand that. But my thought is you were talking to us about how Paul, um, you know, was resurrected. It's like he hung on as long as he wanted to. As long as he wanted to be alive, he was alive. He, it was like a choice. You could tell. Now, it seemed like they were walking out this very thing much closer in the new testament than we are now how did we lose that i mean do you have any idea i do actually uh two words dark ages so there was a whole ton of persecution that happened in the early centuries and actually there's a guy named richard murray really awesome guy uh, his website is thegoodnessofgod.com, I believe. It is thegoodnessofgod, I think it's .com. If you check that out, he's got a bunch of free ebooks and stuff. He's gone all throughout history and looked at, like, church history and looked at where, basically, did we depart from the original gospel message. And it actually is a pretty significant departure because even the idea of hell, um, and this opens up a whole other ball of, you know, can of worms about universalism and this, that, and the other, which I don't even know that we have time to get into, but um, the idea that hell, fire, or whatever you want to call it, was purgative, meant to purge so that we could be it, one with God. It was never meant as a punitive thing. It was never meant as this judgment of fiery hell. But the, every time where you see God talking in Scripture, it's talking about refiner's fire. It's talking about something that burns out the dross so that what's left, all that remains, is is the things that are good, gold, diamonds, life. Um, so so if you look, how, how, how did all this happen? How did we lose it? Well, once... once a lot of uh, sort of essentially pagan beliefs got brought into the church uh, throughout early history. Augustine, you know, is heralded as one of the greats, but he and some of the others helped usher in this idea that hell is is this place of torment. And honestly, that was a pagan belief. It still is a pagan belief. Tartarus and Gehenna and all these uh, Hades, you know, all of these things that are pagan beliefs that have. Uh, they, they've edged their way into the church. And that's what I said with the Gnostic gospel. You know, the Gnostics believe that Jesus, uh, that we have to leave this physical behind to go um, 
to go have this spiritual reality because that's where perfection is. And that's not the gospel that Jesus preached. So I think over time, the enemy has just tried to insert and, and bring darkness so that we'd be in ignorance. But, you know, Jesus continues to bring and re-reveal the truths uh, to us. So, I mean, in the Dark Ages, if you remember, there was a whole issue with the church. I mean, nobody could read. Nobody could read what the Bible said. And once Martin Luther got a hold of it, and he's like, I'm actually reading what it says. Um, he said, that's not what the Bible says. The righteous will live by faith. He's like, there's there's a different gospel than the church has been preaching for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. And now that we can actually read it, um, we can see that it says something different. Um, now, he, I mean, he was a he was a you know a Catholic priest. He wasn't trying to you know leave the church and whatever. But he basically said, look, this is what the Bible actually says. With Gutenberg and the printing press, you know that that was a game changer because now the common people can get the book into their hands. Now they can read these things to themselves. And now instead of somebody else saying, "Here's what it is," you better take my word for it because you don't speak Latin. Um, now people could see for themselves. So I think I think that's really, really what happened is during the Dark Ages, it was the Dark Ages, the enemy brought a lot of darkness in, and God has been restoring revelation to the church, you know, century after century um, over time to, to bring that gospel back to us. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, I was thinking of the, and it's I don't think it's a parable, but when Jesus was talking about Lazarus, you know, the rich guy, and then the other, and the other dude, um, and, oh, they don't say his name, but he was a beggar. The poor guy or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it says that he, he died and he went to hell and he was in torment. So how does that jive, you know, with, with what you were just saying? Well, I do believe hell is a place of torment, but the question is, did God design it to be a place of torment, or is it simply what you get when you have an absence of the presence of God? I mean, in reality, if you look at what the Bible says about God, about all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say anywhere all who call upon the name of the Lord while they're alive on earth in a body. It says all who call upon the name of the Lord. I actually know two different people who died. I don't remember if both committed suicide. At least one of them committed suicide and died. They were in hell and remember being in hell. And they cried out to Jesus while dead in hell. And they got brought back to life. So... Theoretically, even though the Bible, you know, we say, oh, well, once you're dead, it's too late. Well, clearly it's not, because again, I know two people who broke the rules. So if we can have if we can have people who break the rules, then clearly the rule is not what we think it is. So the fact is, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved throughout time and eternity. The the Bible says that uh, the land Jesus is the land who was slain before the foundations of the world. If you actually Actually, look in the Greek or Hebrew or whatever whatever language that's in. Um, BlueLetterBible.com is a great way to look some of this stuff up. Um, uh, that's where I do a lot of stuff. If I want to say, what does it actually say? Um, you know, instead of what my translation says, I have an idea of what it might mean. What does it actually say? I go look it up on uh, BlueLetterBible.com. Yeah, he is a ridiculous testimony about being in hell. Um, and he doesn't actually even like to talk about it all that much because it's that horrible. But um, but that's because it's the absence of God, and there's demons and torment there. But the demons are the ones doing a lot of the tormenting. It's not like God's saying there, hey, stick him again. Um, so so um, if he, Jesus is the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world, it literally means before the moment of conception of time and space. Time and space, is, time and space are inextricably linked. If you don't have space and time, you don't have a reality, basically, because space is where it happens, time is when it happens. So if you don't have space, you don't have a place for time to occur. If you don't have time, you don't have a when that things exist. So space and time are inextricably linked, and if Jesus was slain before the moment where time and space existed, that's eternity. So in eternity, he's the slain lamb. Well, who is he slain for in eternity, if not those in eternity? I mean, we know he was slain in time for those in time, but... He was the lamb who was slain in eternity, which means that the slain lamb's blood works in eternity, not just inside of the time realm. So even after you die, it's not too late. That's why you can raise the dead. That's why, heretically as this may sound, people can get saved out of hell after they die in eternity. Because all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is where people then say, oh, well, that's universalist. Well, yeah, I guess technically it could be. But this isn't the, oh, ever, all, all paths lead to heaven. This is called... Yeah, you'll go to hell, but Jesus is so incredibly merciful. His power, his arm is not too short to save. So even if it takes trillions of eons, the love of God is still going to break through your darkness and he's going to bring you out of hell and out of your inner torment 
into heaven. Now, how long that's going to take in eternity, I have no idea. That's not my job. That's God's. But if you look at what the scriptures actually say, I, I refer to this as the doctrine of, uh, of eternal courtship, that God never gives up on us. Because if you can die and go to hell and be there for all of eternity, then that means God lied. How did he lie? 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. Clearly love did fail. Love failed a lot of times for a lot of people. Because if God's perfect love never fails, then nobody would end up in hell. Or at least nobody would stay there. So I personally believe that the blood of Jesus is powerful throughout all of time and all of eternity, can, can and will save everybody, and I actually believe that Satan will someday get saved. Again, I guess some of this stuff is maybe unpopular or kind of, you know, new for people, but I believe that because of the nature of who God is, how he revealed himself in Scripture, and what he actually said about himself, that if he is indeed all-powerful, then we've got to stop... Uh, exactly, it's a whole other event. Let those said, I didn't even really want to go into that because it just... It's its own, you know, discussion. But um, basically, if we look at the idea of all these limitations that we've placed on God, who he is, what he's like, what he can and can't do, and we just remove those limitations, then literally anything is possible. And God said, with God, all things are possible. So maybe it is possible. Maybe with God, people that we think can't be saved and have died and are in hell, maybe they can actually, because maybe Jesus is powerful enough that hell can't keep him out. It didn't keep him out the first time. It literally says he went down and preached the souls of the dead. So if hell couldn't keep him out once, and now he's got the keys to death, hell, and the grave, right? If he's got the keys of hell, hell can't keep him out. So I think Jesus can go in there and talk to as many people as many times as he wants. And I think we just got to let Jesus be Jesus in that regard. So, um, see, so yeah, I mean, hell exists. These things happen and these things exist. But hell was never meant for people. And it was, it, it, it's not actually required to be permanent, even though that's not what we've been taught. So I don't know if that quite hit your question or not, but it's kind of, like I said, it's a huge topic all on its own. Yeah, yeah, it did. It, it did hit my question. I appreciate your answer. Also, just just wanted to say that I was I looked it up, and uh, Romans was written in, and this is, you know, on a, off of a website, 58 AD. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians are 57, so it's actually you got a whole year afterward. Oh, well, there you go. So yeah. <laughs> that, that's actually interesting. That's that's fascinating to me, because if you look at what Romans talks about, it, it seems like there's a little bit more advanced of this understanding of life and death in this gospel message than when Paul was writing it in the end of Corinthians. So that is fascinating. Thanks for checking that. Yeah, you bet. I mean, you know, revelation for everybody is ongoing. It's occurring. It doesn't just stay once. Um, OK, does anyone else have any questions? For Michael, jump on in there. Don't be shy. Anyone? I haven't been mean to anyone yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I, it's one thing I like about you is that all the questions that I see people ask when you write, um, like Facebook posts and something, and they just think I'm and I read the question knowing that they're trying to stump you and all that. And you just really have these great answers. I mean, you have scripturally sound answers. And I think it just puts a lot of um, stop to debate, but also gives someone something to go back and look at the word with. So that's to me, that's great. Anybody want to jump in there with any kind of questions? Yeah, I had one. Uh, I wrote it down in chat. Um, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, it's like, what if other people around you are like, they're saying, like, you're not going to get healed. And like, I know I'm already healed, but I'm, I'm waiting for the um, glory to me. <laughs> But, um, you know, I don't know if you thought, how, how can we get around people that, that, um, curse us with their words? They, not knowing they're cursing us, but, um, you know, they're cursing us. Yeah. Uh, honey, what's your name? Diane. 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 Um, yeah. Diane, that's a very that's a very good question. Um, I think I think there's a couple things. One is when I talk to people, I actually um, 
some depending on the situation, I'll say something. And by that, I mean, you know, um, like I literally do this at work. Uh, so my, my coworkers know that I believe that I'm never going to die because they'll say things like, oh, whatever, you know, when I die. And I say, well, I've decided I'm going to skip that. They're like, what do you mean? I said, I don't feel like dying. I don't I don't I don't really think I want to do that. So I'm just going to skip death entirely. They're like, what? How does that work? And I'm like, well, I'm simply going to not die. Uh, and, and depending, we may get an, a, an actual conversation about it. But I mean, in the short, in the short, I will sometimes literally either under my breath or, you know, whatever in this, sometimes out loud to other people, just literally negate the comment. Um, well, you can do that if you want. I, I've just decided I'm not going to, um, <laughs> you know, so you can sometimes just negate the word curse in that moment. But the other thing, too, is bless those who curse you. You know, in your own time in prayer, you could even just say, you know what, Father, this person didn't mean to, you know, forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. You know, <laughs> um, this person doesn't understand, but I break that curse off in the name of Jesus, and I just release the blessing of life. I release whatever it is, you know, pray the opposite of what they cursed you with uh, back onto them and just release the blessing. Because what a man sows, that also will he reap. So as you continue to release the blessing towards them, you're going to reap that same blessing. So... Um, that's my best encouragement, but it can be difficult at times to stay encouraged when um, when you're constantly surrounded by people with these negative mindsets. So some of what you have to do is, one, just say, God, please help me. And then, two, focus on just managing your own internal internal beliefs and mindset and just, just unwaveringly head towards what you believe in. Um, so even if other people are saying, oh, you'll never get healed, just say, you know, I, I disagree. Um, and so, Diane, I want to pray for you, actually, for a second. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we break off every curse of the enemy off of her life. We break off every sickness and disease and infirmity. We command right now the life of heaven to fill her body, the healing that she's been praying for and believing for. We command that to manifest, and we loose the angelic host now to make it so in Jesus' name. Amen, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, um, like, like physically, well, physically, that's what it's all about. But, um, like, like sickness and pain, like, I've never had, well, I have had pain, but like, I don't have pain like you think I should. But um, like when I was 19, I think, um, I had, uh, I met Dr. Schombach. Uh -huh. He's, <laughs> Well, he was old, but like I was 19 and he prayed for me at that time. And like, I've never been really in pain from, from stuff from before. Yeah. But, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the glory to me to have a, manifest thank yeah. you my pleasure yeah i think we all we all just agree for you to be completely restored into whatever it is that god has for you hey man and you know michael um diane is a powerhouse i mean she prays for people and she's we see healing just manifest on our classes and everything it's just she's amazing she's an amazing person um i was i was going to ask you a question what okay a lot of people on the on this class, I know this might be the first time they've ever heard anybody speak on this. This is, you know, the head is reeling still. This is new. This is different. What, what's a good book to start in? I know Romans sounds like it's an excellent book. Can you recommend anything else for people to maybe look into who are going, I want to read more about this. I want to know more about this. What, what would you suggest for new starters uh, who are thinking about this? If, you, if you're thinking about this, I would say the book of John and then the book of Romans are probably the best two to start with. The thing is, it's peppered all throughout the Bible. Like, there's verses in Isaiah that talk about, um, I'm trying to think of what, there's, there's, one that, there's one verse that says something to the effect of, like, um, 
those who live to a hundred are, are going to be like, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but those who live to be a hundred are going to be like mere babes. Those who die before then are considered a curse because they, it's like they died in their youth. Um, and, and whatever this verse is talking about, it's talking about how basically a hundred years is nothing. That's like you just become an adult and you're starting, really starting to live your life. Um, so, so you actually, you'll see all throughout the Old Testament, you'll, you'll hear it talk about with long life, you know, the Lord will give you long life. Well, how long is long? I mean, we say 122 is Jean Calment, you know, that she's the oldest verifiable woman person we know alive. Yes, that one. Um, whatever that verse was. Um, <laughs> somebody just popped it up on the screen. But, um, but I mean, we, we think 122 years is long. Well, if you make it to 122 years, what if you just make it to 140 years? And once you've made it to 140, well, what if you can go longer? Like long life is really relative to the person who's experiencing it. Um, I would prefer to be in the multiple of hundreds. And by the time I reach 300 and something, then I don't really think I'm going to be convinced I ever need to die. Um, so, so any time in the Old Testament or New Testament you see long life, think leading towards immortality, because eventually if you just keep living longer. Uh, but, but to answer directly, I would say the book of John and then the book of Romans. And I would do it in that order, and the reason is that you want to see what it is that Jesus actually said. Because, because at the end of the day, like if I have to prioritize, and I do prioritize, but if I have to prioritize the importance of who I'm going to listen to, uh, everybody likes to, you know, hold up Job as this prime example of how we should believe about God and what he thinks about, you know, whatever. Um, I think Job is a very poor example, but I think Jesus is a very good example. Um, I don't see God taking away a whole lot. I don't see him taking away life. I don't see him, you know, the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, okay. Well, that's Job's inferior revelation of an inferior whatever under an old covenant. And Job probably wasn't even an Israelite to begin with. So he really doesn't understand what's going on. Because he's under an inferior revelation. So Jesus came to reveal the Father. He even said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father because we're the same person. So what did Jesus say? Because if you know what Jesus said, you know what the Father says because they're the same person. So anything that you see in the life of Jesus is the same thing that you're going to see in the heart of the Father. It's the same thing you're going to see demonstrated in the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus is the pinnacle of all existence. He is the word that, that sustains all of creation. He is God. So start with the book of John, see what Jesus actually said. And the crazy thing is, as you read the book of John and see what Jesus actually said, it's going to blow your mind because you're like, oh my God, how many times have I read these verses and never seen these things that are plainly written in front of my face? Um, I mean, the first time I really started to see this, I'm like, oh my goodness, like how did how did I not see this? And it's because the enemy blinds our eyes. Uh, so it's nobody's fault, and that's why God reveals truth to us. Um, and then, you know, head on over after you do that, head on back over to Romans, and that is just this wealth that it's constantly talking about sin and death and righteousness and life and, you know, the body that brings death and cutting off sin. I mean, it's, it's kind of complex, but uh, as you just kind of go back and forth throughout the book of Romans, it just paints this picture of, of, of how, how exactly the mechanism in the spirit by which uh, we, we step into this righteousness leading to eternal life. That's good. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. Um, does anyone else have any questions? You know, you get, you, you fit like, I don't know, three hours worth of talking into <laughs> our time. <laughs> 45 minutes. <laughs> Praise God. I, talk I, fast. I uh, love <laughs> it. I love it. I hear fast. So it's all good. Yeah. Well, I want to say one more thing. Um, and this is just, just kind of some general stuff to keep in mind for the future. Um, in my book, it's called Faith to Raise the Dead. Um, the whole book itself is basically talking about raising the dead, obviously. But... <laughs> um, but, but throughout the book, I do reference immortality because it's inextricably linked with resurrection. Like I was saying at the beginning of the call, like if... if all that happens is you die and that's it. And we raise you and you die again and that's it. Like, that's dumb. So, like, it's it's impossible in my mind. It's impossible to separate healing and resurrection and, and immortality because they are all the same manifestation of the abundant life of Christ. So, in that book, I do start to touch on, on immortality a little bit. Um, 
But it, but that book also is designed to really give people a framework to understand the will of God uh, related to death and life. So if, if you're wanting just kind of a general mind renewal, I will tell you this is also a little more gentle than this message you just heard today. Uh, because it's talking more about resurrection, which is a little more familiar concept, but it all leads and points towards the same thing we've been discussing today. So that's something else to consider. The other thing is I'll say, if you guys go to thekingsofeden.com, kings is plural, kings of, thekingsofeden.com, uh, if you guys sign up for my mailing list, um, you, the, next one, the next one or two books that I'm going to be working on, I kind of always am working on books, but... I don't know if it will be the next one published or not, but I'm going to be writing a book called The Gospel of Life and Immortality, or at least that's the title I'm going with right now. Um, so it's going to be all about this subject. So the scriptures we covered today will be in there. A lot more scriptures will be in there. It, it's going to do my best to lay it all out as clearly as possible throughout the whole Bible, cover all these concepts, talk about immortality in the end times, like how does that relate you know, with these end time beliefs. Like I, I'm going to try and basically cover as much as I can to really flesh out this subject. So um, if you have more questions, stay tuned. Um, the other thing is that if you haven't heard of him, there's a guy named Tyler Johnson. He's an amazing guy. He is also writing a book on this subject as we speak. So uh, his website is one glance, O-N-E-G-L-A-N-C-E, like with one glance of his eyes, oneglance.org. A good friend of mine, awesome guy, loves Jesus. Um, he also is the guy who's the founder of the Dead Raising Teams, all about resurrection. Yes, that one. Resurrection and life. So um, he, he, we're kind of traveling in a very similar track, if you will. And he's also writing a book. I forget what it's called. But if you guys want to kind of stay up on things that are coming out about this, that would be another person that you hop on, hop on his mailing list and you'll know when the book comes out. So... Um, those would be some good, I guess, future resources for you as you as you continue to pursue. Okay, great. And I also um, I put in chat the information for Michael again. Links. Uh, he has a blog Facebook page as well, so I put that link there, and then I put his first uh, his personal Facebook page. I hope that's okay, Michael. Oh, that's perfectly fine, yeah. Okay, um, I will be honest. If you guys friend request me, um, if you send me a private message and just say, hey, I was on the Adventures and Identity call, what happens is I'm always at, like, the 5,000-person limit. So eventually, every now and again, I'll go through and, like, get rid of people I, am like, have never seen them ever once comment on a single thing I've ever, ever seen, which means, and they're from Pakistan, which just means that... Not that I have anything against anyone from Pakistan. Jesus loves them too. It's just sometimes they're sort of seeking people to just give to their ministry. So they just spam people with friend requests. And I just accept a lot of them because I don't know who's who. Um, so eventually, you know, people who are spammers or whatever, I end up cleaning all those empty ones out because I'll go through and there's just a bunch of basically dead, non-existent people uh, in the friends list. So I just clear all those out and then accept new ones. So... Um, it may not let you, because once you hit the 5,000, it may not let you send a friend request. Like I said, just private message me and I'll work it out. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I totally <laughs> understand about that. You can tell when they're not even a real Facebook page either. It's just almost hilarious and yeah. <laughs> you check them out. Well, I mean, but... I look through some of those. I look through some of them, but I mean, sometimes it's just like, oh, I have five extra spaces. So I just click accept the first five that are right there and... If they don't seem to, you know, spam me, I don't even bother looking. So, <laughs> well, you're very generous. <laughs> oh, I pre appreciate your heart in that. I'm like, who it's wants generous, to be my it's friend? It's time expenditure. It takes too much time to try and hunt down every single person to make sure they're legit. So I just accept them and figure it out later. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. That makes more sense. All right. Well, who does anyone have any questions or comments or anybody want to, you know, just let us know how you, this went for you. How did you feel about this? Is is this raising yeah. some, you know, um, some I comments? I just wanted to comment. Um, thank you. I have a lot to, um, I would say, to ponder on. But you definitely opened up my mind to a lot of different things. So thank you. Oh, certainly. I'll say something else, guys. If you guys have objections, like, that's okay to voice, too. Like, you don't, like, I don't need yes men. Like, if you guys are like, I really don't see this. Like, it's okay to have disagreeing points or questions or thoughts, too. So if you're like, huh, I'm not sure about this, like, it's okay to voice that as well, all right? Yeah, that's great because, 
You know, um, if it can't stand, if, if what you're believing can't stand um, someone voicing an objection and then you having an answer, it's, it's kind of weak. It, it's weak. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got to be able to. And for me, I... Uh, anymore, I if I find something interesting, I start bringing it to the Lord, and He starts revealing things to me in pieces. I never feel like I have to swallow the whole sandwich at once. I can take it a bite at a time and allow it to digest, allow the Holy Spirit to show me more of the Word, and you know what I mean. Just take it step by step as a process, and then allow God to help me to step into a new revelation. Because I can't do it all at once. I've already learned that's not something that I can just jump off and do. Um, and maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my personality type. I don't know. But I, I really like to um, kind of chew on things, meditate on them for a while, and, and allow myself to um, be heard by the Lord and have him hear, hear me too. Or I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself correctly. Yeah. It's, anyway. like, it's like LeVar Burton said in Reading Rainbow, but you don't have to take my word for it. Da, da, da. Oh, like, I love that show. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I mean, it, I'm, I'm going where I'm going, and I'm going where I feel like the Lord's leading me. Um, unapologetically, sometimes people are like, well, whatever. I'm like, I, look, I'm, I'm just heading forward. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to come, that's fine. If you don't want to, that's okay, too. Um, and that might sound really arrogant and or judgmental, and I don't mean it that way. It's just I'm pursuing what the Lord's leading me to do. And if if this isn't something that the Lord's speaking to you right now, or if it's not where he's leading you right now, like, that's fine. Um, just kind of put that on your mental shelf and say, okay, Lord, you know, bring around what you want, when you want, confirm what you want. And God's big enough to do that. Like, um, I, I wrote, the last book I wrote was on, uh, it's called The Beginner's Guide to Traveling in the Spirit. Well, I'll be honest, I wrote that book because I think the book needed to be written, but it's not something I'm really focusing much on. It's something I have in the past focused on much more. And I have friends I, of mine who are much more focused and, and really pursuing that subject much more than I am. Um, so I'm not anti-spirit travel. It's just that it's not really where my heart's at and it's not really where I'm pursuing. So there's some things that people are like, oh, you should join this group and we're doing this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, it's cool and it's good. It's just not where I'm, it's just not where I'm headed right now. Mm. So, um, Again, it's all, you know, God's going to work it all out and everybody's in a different place. So whether you object, whether you just have questions, whether whatever, like just know that God's God's going to lead and guide you and confirm to you the things that he wants because his Holy Spirit lives in you. So we can trust Jesus to take care of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that really struck me when you spoke about earlier, Michael, was that you said that the people use those phrases, when I get old, you know, and my sister does this, I just want to reach through the phone, slap her. But, it, and you know what? I figured, why do I get so err about it? Well, it's because the Holy Spirit within me is going, what's that about? You know, and I'm agreeing with them. We're high-fiving. Like, what is that trash talk? That is trash talk. That is death talk. That is so not kingdom. And it just bugs me. I can't stand it when people say that. And one of the reasons why it bothers me so much, I think, is because that's such a defeatist attitude. So how can that fit into the accomplishment of Christ. How can that fit? And how can it still stand when we think about who Jesus is, was, and is, and, you know, the sacrifice that he made, the price that he paid with himself, and we still have this junk? I don't know. It just really just bothered me so much. When someone says that, even if it's my dad, you know, or my mom, they say it, and I'm like, just be quiet already. Just shut up with it because I don't want to hear it. <laughs> it is wrong, you know? And so, yeah, that was one of the things that really got me started thinking. I thought, why does this bother me so much? Well, that's why. Because it doesn't fit in to the perfectness of Jesus. It doesn't. And I got tired of hearing that. And I, I really watch myself because we can even say, um, like little innuendos that agree with decay, that agree with, um, allowing, uh, aging, you know, and stuff like that. And me and my husband keep ourselves accountable to each other. You know, we got the stink eye back and forth at each other when it's about <laughs> to come out. Like, what you do? What are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. We need to do that for each other because that's not who we are. That is not who we are. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate it, Michael. I appreciate you coming out. Again, is there anybody else who has anything they would like to say before we close out tonight? And I'm sorry I was talking to myself, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Okay. There's, well, Michael, there's I would just... 
I just like to say, man, you've really torn down some walls because I realize that when I read scripture, we've, we've got certain walls, we've got certain contexts that we've already have in mind as we read. And, um, and so what you've done is you've taken down some walls so that when I go back and reread that, the walls that I had up of what that's supposed to mean or within which we subconsciously read, you know, those, those walls got to go. So um, thank you ever so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Really glad to hear that. Um, there's one, Dana, there's one thing I wanted to say, and this just related to, if any of you guys, you know, are interested in the subject of spirit travel, the courts of heaven, there's a blog post I have, and I don't remember what it's called, but it's something having to do with like court case and alignments with death or something. It's on my blog post, but it's a, uh, it's it's an encounter I had in the spirit where I was in this courtroom in heaven and basically broke off these agreements that I'd made with the spirit of death, um, which just related to this subject you guys might find interesting and or a useful exercise for yourselves. Um, but I think it's something like breaking off alignments. To death. Again, if you look up the word court case or alignment on the blog, it, it should come up. Um, good. I'll look that up. Sounds good. Appreciate it. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll close out tonight. Michael, thank you again. I appreciate you coming on so much. Every time you speak with us, um, I just love it and I can't wait for the next time. Uh, and I know you work hard and, and you usually sleep during the day because Michael works at night as a nurse. Gosh, take my hat off to you. I could only do uh, uh, nights at a hospital. I, I worked in the ER, or not in the ER, but as the ER admitter and for about four months and I thought I was just going to lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't do it anymore but yeah the best part was was admitting new babies <laughs> that was the best part but so we'll we're gonna let you get to sleep um let me just pray us out father thank you so much thank you holy spirit thank you for everything that was done and said tonight um the hearts and the minds that were teachable tonight lord that were um, maybe questioning, but still, Father, listening for your voice on things. And I, that's just all I pray, Lord. I just pray that your voice would be more clear than any kind of tradition or any kind of walls, as Jennifer said, that we might have set up against something um, that limits your word. And so I thank you, Lord. I just bless everybody on the call. I thank you for Michael. I ask a blessing on him. I thank you for favor to be on him and his wife and his beautiful grandchildren. And I just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.